So, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this third session of the Nordic SNC conference today. We have a session on music perception and cognition, gestural research. Um, this is a mixed bag of goodies, and we look forward to hear the presentations. We also have the presenters. Uh, for each of the, of the papers available for questions. So uh, once you see something that you would like to ask about them, please put your questions in the question and answer tab and we'll address them after the show is finished. So with this, we're ready to hear the talks. Hello everybody, my name is Madalina Ana Maria Anastasa and today I will be talking about an investigation I have conducted alongside Nils Meyer-Kallen and Sebastian Schleck. Our work is called Assessing Room Acoustic Memory Using a Yes-No and a Two-Alternative First-Choice Paradigm. The motivation behind this work is twofold. Firstly, we believe that room acoustic memory is a cognitive ability that plays an essential role in plausible virtual acoustics for extended realities. And to our knowledge, there is little conclusive work into this field. And secondly, we use this work as an example for testing an important theoretical assumption of detection theory that relates the yes-no and the two alternative forced choice tasks. We expect that such tasks will be of increasing importance in virtual acoustics as they are the best choice for evaluating plausibility of acoustic rendering in VR. Now, in the next two slides, we will go a bit more in, in depth into the background of these two motives. And we will begin with room acoustic memory. Uh, auditory memory has been studied by acoustic psychologists for many years. While a classical model of memory me mechanism, which involves auditory sensory uh, memory, has been defined for verbal sounds, the exact encoding and maintenance strategies are less clear for nonverbal sounds. In terms of room acoustics, one question that we could possibly ask is if a user has heard a particular room before, would they be able to recognize its acoustic properties? In our test, we have tried to answer this question by assessing how well participants could remember the sound of everyday rooms over a very short time span. One of our hypotheses could be that listeners encode sound by extracting several acoustic attributes of the room and then remember this information. While our experiment does not go as deep as to test these specific mechanisms, it still represents a first step in testing uh, memory for acoustics. Regarding detection theory, we conducted two listening tests using a both yes-no and a two alternative forced choice test. In the first paradigm, participants decide whether samples are either familiar or new. The analysis used for these results can be applied to memory studies, but also to many different questions, such as regarding the plausibility of virtual acoustic renderings. The most important feature of a yes-no test is that the subject is presented with one item per trial. In contrast to this, in a two alternative force choice test, participants are presented with two alternatives, one of which is always familiar, one of which is always new. And participants are decided to, um, uh, but participants need to decide which one is which. Uh, detection theory pre uh, predicts the sensitivity difference by a factor of a square root of two between these two paradigms. And in our test, we have tried to test the applicability of this conversion factor in practice. So let's talk about our experiment. So our experiment consisted of a yes-no task session and a two AFC task session, each preceded by a training session. In the training session itself, uh, the subject uh, was not time limited and whenever he was ready to proceed, there were, was a break of 15 seconds in which the original sound source without any room response was played. The break was included there to minimize the effect of uh, auditory sensory memory, which may allow participants to store the signals themselves for several seconds. Uh, the GUI of the test can be seen in the slide that we are looking at right now. Uh, in total, we have used 10 different environmental impulse responses measured in daily life locations from a data set provided by MIT. The locations vary from medium-sized rooms, like an office or a classroom, to larger spaces, such as a garage and a train station hallway, and even outdoor spaces, 
like a house balcony or a tram stop shelter. Then the impulse responses were convolved with three different sound sources that we chose, namely conga drums, uh, guitar, and the speech sample. The order of presenting the tasks themselves was randomized across subjects so that we could investigate whether the order in which the tests are presented has any effects on the sensitivity itself. And in total, we had 10 subjects, master or PhD students who participated in the test, which was conducted at the Alto Acoustics Lab. Uh, now that we heard about the experiment, let's have a listen to some sound examples so, we, so that we can get a clearer view of the test itself. We are going to begin with the impulse response of a hallway. And move on to an art gallery. Le front froid qui traverse le pays d'est en ouest provoque un changement de temps et une baisse sensible des températures. Then we have a bookstore. And an office. And finally, we have somewhere outside the street. Le front froid qui traverse le pays d'est en ouest provoque un changement de temps et une baisse sensible des températures. Okay, what we are looking now here is violin plots displaying the sensitivity of the participants between paradigms and stimuli. As expected, participants perform better in the two alternative first choice tasks, uh, while the yes-no experiment had an overall percentage of correct responses of 66, the two AFC tasks had an overall percentage of 72. However, while this trend follows our expectation, the effect of the paradigm on the sensitivity is not statistically significant. And this is due to the large variability between the participants as it can be seen in the first figure. The second figure shows a comparison of the experiment order, which also had no significant effect on the sensitivity itself either. Therefore, participants did not perform better in the second test because they had familiarized themselves with the task. The third figure, however, shows that the signal conditions had a significant impact on the sensitivity, and this effect is mainly due to the low performance of the guitar sample when compared to the conga or the speech. Regarding the, conven the conversion factor between the two paradigms, it was, fine. it was found that while the assumption holds true when taking all the data of each paradigm together, on an individual basis, the performance varies strongly between participants. So what our results have shown us is that subjects can recognize different rooms above chance level, but even with relatively large differences between the rooms, the accuracy is still low in general. It was also shown that the signal type influences the sensitivity as the performance was lower for the guitar sample. Now with such a strong variation between the participants, it could be indicated that the ability to remember room acoustics might vary strongly between individuals. And with regards to the conversion factor, we have seen that while it holds true for the complete data set, the performance difference between the tasks varies strongly between participants. And this suggests that uh, using this relation might not always be reliable. So to conclude, in this test, we have found that the square root relationship relating the yes-no and the two AFC tasks is only approximated well when taking into consideration the whole data set with all subjects into account. And when it comes to room memory, subjects can recognize different rooms above chance level, but with the large differences between the selected rooms, the sensitivity can still be considered fairly low. Furthermore, the choice of stimuli seems to play an important part too, and we have seen this for the guitar sample, as the familiar and new renderings were completely indistinguishable for subjects. So that is all from my side. Thank you very much for your attention, and I welcome all your questions. Hello, and welcome to our presentation. We wrote a paper about gamifying ear training for cochlear implant users. The authors of the paper are Jonas Anderson, Stefania Serafin, Mariana Vati, and myself, Titas Lasitskas. I'll present you our project. We sought out to design a game training cochlear implant users who have diminished hearing compared to normal listeners. 
In order to do so, we aimed for a game that was very accessible for the target group of cochlear users while training their music perception using different methods. It was key for us to design training application which engaged the cochlear user through gamification while experts such as audiologists and aiding staff could track their progress through a feedback system. We ended up creating two different games, where the first one is a rhythm-focused game, having some sort of rhythm pattern matching aspect. That would guide the cochlear user to keep a rhythm by not giving them too much visual information. The game was inspired by Guitar Hero or Dance Dance Revolution, while keeping a simple perspective like Super Mario Brothers. For the pitch game, the same two-dimensional perspective was kept in order to keep the games consistent with each other in design. Here, a reference pitch would play alongside a random pitch. The user's task is to check whether the pitch is of higher or lower tone, something that cochlear users can have a hard time distinguishing. We designed the game as having main character who had to pass through different obstacles in order to win. For the first obstacle, the rhythm game, the main character found himself in a cave where he has to run towards the end while collecting coins. The coins count as the variable to see how accurate cochlear implant user was with hitting each note that passed them on a horizontal plane. After the user learned the rhythmic pattern, the coins would start to get visually abstracted which requires the cochlear implant user to follow along the rhythmic pattern only by sound. This would tie into difficulty scaling, whereas the rhythmic patterns would also increase in difficulty. For the pitch game, we ended up designing a scenario where the main character flies through the air in order to progress. The user has to guess whether the reference note hasn't changed. In such case, the user flies towards the middle sphere. If the tone is higher towards the upper sphere, or if the tone is lower, than the reference tone, the user flies towards the lower sphere. The variable to track the progress is how many correct guesses the cochlear implant user got. For the difficulty scaling, we primarily focused on decreasing the size of intervals played since cochlear implant users have a hard time hearing smaller intervals. All these variables mentioned before, the coins and the correct guesses would be logged to a scoreboard that the audiologist could have access in order to monitor any improved changes in the cochlear implant users and see whether the training was beneficial. The scoreboard would also be shown to the cochlear implant users, but the progress would not be compared to other users as to not enforce any competitive environment that might make some users feel worse compared to others. For the testing, we were sadly only able to acquire three cochlear implant users, one being in mid-40s and other two being above 70. Hereby, we focused on extracting a lot of qualitative data instead seeing how game performed with the cochlear implant users. For that, we went for semi-structured interviews as well as card picking, in our case, Microsoft reaction cards. In the results, we can see that the rhythm game had the best results when it comes to positive card picking, which comes to no surprise as cochlear implant users have a general easier time understanding rhythmic attributes in music rather than pitch. However, both games had quite high ratings for exciting and interesting, which indicates that cochlear implant users are open to the idea of games as a training platforms. For more in-depth answer, as to what the cochlear implant user had to say about the games, we can see quotes such as I think this is very good task to train and evaluate how you perceive the sound. It is catching right now because you have to concentrate on it and you don't know what it was about. I fall behind. I can't make it. In the beginning, the rhythm was nice when it came one by one. As soon as more popped up, it went bad. It requires more routine and training. For the overall 
results, we also found that the experience with cochlear implant also differed a lot in the experiences with the games. One test participant was already listening to jazz music using his cochlear implant and he had quite good results with the games as well compared to the other cochlear implant users. There were also a lot of technical issues, such as swiping gestures for the pitch game not being super responsive, which confused all the participants. It is important to have a responsive game in order to not confuse the users, which would start blaming their own capabilities. Lastly, the game presented very cartoony colors, which the cochlear implant users of the older age group did not appreciate. One of the participants preferred a more retro look like pixelated graphics to make the game look more familiar. Throughout the project, we had a talk with two audiologists and presented them the idea of our gamified training application for cochlear implant users. They were very open about the scoreboard idea to track their patient's progress. Hereby, they further discussed other ideas too. First, having a multiplayer game where the user could play cooperatively with other users or the therapist, either locally or online, asynchronous or synchronous. Having a practice level for some of the games where extra aid and no scores would be supplied. Implementing a music theory game where specific topics could be covered, such as notated rhythms, notated music, harmony, etc. They mentioned that music theory is highly beneficial for the training, stating that a big part of enjoying music is being able to understand it. And lastly, a separate application made for audiologists to track the progress of their patients would be perfect. There, they would see the data from the game of each of their patients. This way, the improvements would be easily tracked. In conclusion, the game was seen to have potential with valuable insights gained on what could be done to improve it in the future iterations. The input from the audiologists and cochlear implant users concluded that more training exercises and music theory would be helpful. The responsiveness of the user input could be improved as well as the difficulty scaling and instructions. Thank you all for participating in this presentation and you're welcome to ask any questions. Hello there. Today we are going to talk about the Musical Gestures Toolbox for Python, which is a new version of the Musical Gestures Toolbox. And it all started many years ago um, when I got interested in looking at how we could use cameras to capture human body motion. And then I also looked, started looking at how can you do this with dancers and make music performances uh, based on how you move. Um, so this eventually turned out into a toolbox for Max uh, with various types of tools and modules for uh, making interactive dance performances. Eventually, this grew also into more of an analytical package. As we started doing more scientific analyses, we realized it was necessary to provide some tools for working inside of MATLAB. And we de developed the Musical Gestures Toolbox into a MATLAB package, where you can, for example, do trimming, you can do cropping, you can do resampling, you can change different types of things in the features in the image, and most importantly, you can also create motion videos that you, where you can kind of see how the body moves in time just based on the original video image. From this, you can also generate a motion history and you can create motion grams, which is kind of a visual representation over time of how the body moves. And this is kind of cool because you can then use that to analyze things together with also with, with the sound. Now let us take a closer look at the Musical Gestures Toolbox for Python. If you are familiar with the MATLAB implementation of Musical Gestures, you will find mostly familiar functions 
with mostly the same names. But the difference in the Python version is that we are much more object oriented. This means that we create objects for videos, images, figures and their lists and then modify their content via calling processes on these. The greater emphasis on the object-oriented design allows us to have hierarchies in our workflow, to have persistent reusable data to maximize our efficiency. When you use the Musical Gestures toolbox, you render a lot of video, image and other types of data over and over again. It was very important for us to maintain a fast rendering process. For this reason, in the newer versions of the Musical Gestures toolbox for Python, we ported most of the rendering functions to use FFmpeg as their backend. This resulted in a 20x, sometimes 30x speedup compared to the previous implementation with running rendering loops in Python. And that is partly because FFmpeg scales so well on the available resources, so you can really benefit from rendering on a server or a more powerful desktop machine. Typically you start importing your video into an MG object, to which you can apply basic pre-processing just like in the Max or MATLAB version of Musical Gestures. You can trim the beginning or end of your video file, you can shorten it by skipping some frames, you can rotate it, perhaps to compensate some unfortunate camera positioning, you can adjust contrast or brightness, you can crop it, and optionally convert it to grayscale, which can save you some rendering time in later processes. You can view your MG object, your pre-processed video, at any time, either in a window or embedded in a Jupyter notebook. Both have their merits. Playing in a window uses FFplay, which gives you a pretty powerful video player that is not afraid of high frame rates or resolutions and can run independently in a non-blocking fashion, so you can keep coding while looking at the result of a previous operation. However, if you are working in a Jupyter notebook or a Google Colab, it is perhaps more convenient to embed the video directly below the code cell. To do this, you can still use the same show method, but with mode set to notebook. I think the really exciting part of musical gestures starts with the video-based processes you can apply to your pre-processed videos. You can visualize motion by extracting a moving actor from a static background. You can then analyze and extract features of the now separated motion and save it as a CSV file or a set of plots. I particularly like the methods that create motion grams and video grams that summarize the motion or the entire video content in a pair of images, one for the x-axis and one for the y-axis. Sometimes you'll want to visualize the trajectory of motion, either with a simple motion history video or more advanced methods such as sparse optical flow or dense optical flow. You can even track all the joints of a person via pose estimation, courtesy of Open Pose, and save the results to a CSV file or as a video overlay. Since the backend for this process is OpenCV, you can enable GPU acceleration and render up to 100 times faster. The Python version of the Musical Gestures toolbox also comes with a set of audio processes that can be really useful when you are studying, for example, music-related body motion. With our Librosa-based audio processes, you can easily create figures of the waveform, spectrogram, tempogram and various other features of your video's audio track. We have also implemented classless function versions of these, so you can use them on audio files as well. A newer feature of the Musical Gestures toolbox allows you to create time-aligned stacked plots of audio analysis data and video visualizations. To create such composite figures, all you have to do is to collect your motion grams, video grams, spectrograms and other data into an MG list and then call as figure on it. The first element in your MG list will be at the top and the last element will be at the bottom of your stack. We take care of all the matplotlib kung fu under the hood so you can focus on getting your results fast with a few lines of code. That being said, the Python package of the Musical Gestures toolbox is far from being complete. 
Speaking of timeline data, in addition to visualization, we would also like to have the ability to export CSV files with the timeline data to feed into further statistical analysis or modeling with machine learning. Just take a look at the issue tracker on GitHub to get an idea. We are also working on adding multi-core support to all the rendering processes that use OpenCV as their backend. Finally, we want to develop a comprehensive test suite to ensure the stability and quality of our package on all platforms and in all the workflows we support. That's it. Thanks for watching. Feel free to pip install musical gestures, read our wiki pages on GitHub, or browse the built-in documentation. So, thank you for the presentations. Uh, I welcome the, the speakers or the speakers that will present. We have uh, uh, Titus, Nils, and I guess Alexander, you will be maybe talking for your presentation. It was nice to see Ritmo. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Um, no one, uh, no one dared the, the questions and answer parts, but, uh, but fortunately I've been reading the papers, so I have plenty of, of questions anyway. And maybe we'll just take it a little bit in, in order. Um, starting with the Rumacal 6 paper. Uh, maybe Nils, you can say, what, what are your thoughts about why is it harder for the guitar? Yeah, I think so. First of all, I, I, I'm just uh, I'm representing Madalina, who's a very uh, ambitious student and is taking an exam right now. So, um, but uh, yeah, I think what what she also uh, um, what we also discussed with her is that the guitar is just it's quite continuous sound. There are no breaks where you can really listen to the reverberant tail, and it seems like that that what people use to remember these things is quite high level uh, acoustic features, which are which are easily um, uh, hurt in in the in the really the reverb tail, and the guitar it's it's much harder to 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 hear that with the other two. Okay, so uh, the, and I was thinking also maybe you could take it a little bit and, and explain to us uh, that, that like from from a from a naive perspective the yes and no also seems like a two alternative first choice, doesn't yeah. it? <laughs> yeah. So, the yeah, the important difference is that that you you only get presented with one uh, with one stimulus. So so kind of the this this relation that the detection theory tells you is that if you get two and you know one is that and one is the, the other, so one is familiar, one is not. You may use basically twice the information because you have uh, yeah you basically have two to to make your decision and then in the yes no yeah of course you have to decide between yes and no but you only get one set of information to to do that and yeah i can quickly say we we got a little bit interested in this because more because um, from the context of um, real virtual experiments with which we are doing so some when there's a sound source that's either in the real room or then presented over headphones and there we are trying to understand a little bit better um, what does it, in which way does it matter how you ask this and how you design this. And, and yeah, here we, we, we tried to uh, ask the same question with, with a different, uh, different task. Yeah. But yeah, I, yeah, I think. I, yeah. <laughs> but, but I find that uh, this is a very interesting. Uh, uh, so I guess it's a little bit, um, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll come back to, to that. But, the, but you also chose uh, uh, within group participant design uh, yeah what is that yeah it's a good question we i think we could have done it also between subjects but but of course it's what we've seen is that that people do it, it depends actually interestingly also in in these more real virtual tests and in this this um uh, yeah related related tests it depends quite a lot on the experience of the participant. So when the sample size is relatively small, then then it's good not to, uh, yeah, not to depend too much on on that. And yeah, and we have also we've seen that that people didn't get much better or worse throughout the test. So, and we also checked that that there was no effect of the like half the people did the one test first and then the other one uh, and the other one later and vice versa. And that there wasn't an, an effect. So. I think it's it's okay. Yeah. 
Thank you very much. You also mentioned the, the users, uh, the, the, you have the use case, which brings me to, uh, to Titus and, and the cochlear implant users. Uh, and I was thinking to, maybe you could also explain a little bit of, about this card selection, because there might be um, people here not, uh, not familiar with that. What, does the, what, is the, what is the thought behind that? And how do you select the, the cards? Uh, so hello, everyone. Uh, hope you can hear me. And uh, the reaction cards basically uh, gives a participant a way to express their feelings without looking for words in the pockets. So we basically give them uh, some amount of cards uh, to select from. And right after they did a task or experience something, we give them uh, those cards, which are arranged in a random order. And then people can choose a couple cards, how they feel, which best describes their feelings. And once they did that, we then uh, further our discussion with them about why those cards were picked and how they felt about it. So that's the reason for the reaction cards. Yeah, so, and, and you say that this, uh, in the paper, you say that <laughs> this was inspired by this uh, Microsoft uh, Experience Toolkit. Uh, but but uh, how did you pick uh, which cards to present to the to the listeners? Uh, the yes, so they have different uh, like uh, amounts of cards you can choose from. So I think we don't remember exactly how many cards we chose, but I think we chose the smaller subset. So it can be from very general subset, which we did, and then it can go to I think fifty cards at maximum that describe many different feelings apps. Uh, so it's a matter of choice how many you want to give. And they chose- Yeah, because I was thinking that, that now when I look at <coughs> the presentation, it seems like uh, you have like mostly positive cards and then uh, the irritating and the others were, was that correctly understood that that I was a, it was not half, half positive, negative, but- It was but, a half, half. It was okay. uh, the cards were half, half. Uh, just the choices were mostly positive. That's what we were trying to say uh, throughout our diagrams that uh, people would choose mostly positive cards, as you saw in the graphs there. Yeah. But uh, overall, the balance was half half. Right. So the, I was also thinking about how, in um, when we have a development together uh, or we're working with projects. And we're presenting that to, to the user group, like for instance, in this case, you have the, the patients and, um, and the audiologists. And we were in a way, we're working together with them, but we also would like their honest opinion. So can you maybe reflect a little bit, how can we avoid that they're just not being nice? Uh, well, first of all, you set up the experiment in such a way that they feel comfortable sharing. Uh, the opinion doesn't matter if it's a bad experience or not. So we tell them that, uh, for example, we want uh, their honest opinion and it's still in development. It's not out yet and we want uh, tips how to improve. So in that case, they might focus more on the negatives rather than positives, which is other side of the scale. But uh, yeah, so I think by just asking them for, for help, that you're still developing. And uh, I think that helps with not get being just nice yeah. on their side. Which also, uh, we also have a question about the, uh, from Alexander. Would you like to say that loud, Alexander? I think you have a good microphone. Yes, yeah, we had this uh, throwing microphone here. Yeah, no, that was uh, that was a question uh, about the age of people. I was just uh, curious about the the effect of age when it comes to cochlear implants. I mean, for normal hearing, I mean, there is a decline in the top frequencies as you as you become older. But I guess you don't have the same issue here. Or how, how did you think about then taking this into account? Uh, so. I think the cochlear implant itself doesn't take those high end frequencies uh in the processing but i'm not a designer of cochlear implants so i might be wrong but uh yeah basically we were planning to have a whole thing for the testing too for all age groups it just so happened that it was 
uh, mostly uh, older people. So we didn't, uh, while testing, we didn't take it into account, but reflecting on that, I think that uh, it should still, like the, one of the participants was using cochlear implant one year, other year had the uh, normal hearing aid. So I think those things influence the testing more. What I find the most intriguing there was that the the forty year old felt that uh, she was too, he or she was too old to play these games. So that says something about how we <laughs> maybe something that, to take into account about the game. Uh, I also had a question about uh, the mapping there. So in the paper you say that you you chose the up and down for the pitch, uh, but also that the audiologists are using the the keyboard mapping for for this but that's not really up and down is it that's uh, that's right and left on on a normal piano keyboard so what is it uh, in, in if you have uh, if you have experience from from music already and and uh, and have had hearing beforehand maybe this mapping of up and down makes sense and and you have learned it but but in if you're uh, if you haven't really had that as a child then this mapping is not necessarily something easily understood. Can you reflect a little bit on that? What, what could be alternatives way of, of making this um, uh, yeah. the pitch game? Yeah, there. so I think I would argue that it's kind of intuitive to choose up and down for higher and lower just because of the definitions of the words, if the pitch went higher or if the pitch went lower. And people usually understand the difference uh, when you say higher or lower pitch. And uh, if you have musical training, you saw the five line. So there the notes also higher ones would be drawn higher up. Uh, so, and also we chose the up down rather than like piano left and right to not confuse the directions of, uh, of the characters going. So from the beginning, uh, the rhythm character in the rhythm level is going from left to right, uh, and that's the movement. And on the pitch game, uh, character is moving the same direction. So it feels like the character is always progressing, which is always good for uh, training and for self-confidence uh, of people who are feeling a bit doubtful about their uh, experiences and about their capabilities. And, and about that, uh, one last question would be, if you, um, if you now were to in include also vocal training in this, I'm not sure if, they, if that's what, um, if they would be wise in terms of that, I imagine that you would have the perceptual training first, but if you also would like to, to have include like vocal voice control in, in this game set, what, what would you do have to do to expand that in uh, from this type of, of, of games that you developed? Yeah, so first thing that would pop into my mind is having basically the same uh, kind of uh, level design as for pitch. So you go up and down, but you just need to sing higher tone or lower tone to move instead of moving with swipes or tapping somewhere to move, you would control the character's movement by your singing. So I think it would be fun and intuitive way to play the game. Thank you, Titus. We'll move on to the third uh, paper. Alexander, uh, what, uh, if you could reflect a little bit of what have been the main challenges in, in this type of implementation for the musical gestures? Uh, a toolbox. So you, as you nicely displayed there in the video, you moved from from the Max to MATLAB to now Python. And what have been the main challenges in, in this? All in the part. Yeah. Uh, so uh, first of all, I am Balint. Oh, sorry, I, I didn't see you. Fingers. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, You're both free to to speak, of course. Yes. Yeah. Uh, it's great to be here. So um, the main challenges, I guess. One of the main challenges were, were to create an easy to use platform for um, researchers, students, educators who, who are not like professional Python programmers, but like just want to use something that gives them results, uh, even like 
complex results fairly easily with a few lines of code offering some kind of consistency, not just in itself, but like across all the Max and MATLAB uh, and command line uh, versions of the musical gestures. That was one um, um, like design challenge, I would say. And a more technical challenge was that, um, uh, as I also mentioned in the video, uh, when you're working with video analysis, you actually uh, render lots of videos, images, and other types of data over and over again. And um, Python is generally not the go-to language when it comes to rendering video frames or you know matrices of uh, pixels. So um, one of the main goals uh, moving towards like a newer version of this Python package was to actually port most of the rendering stuff to FFmpeg. Uh, so in a way we escaped the um, slowness and the, the limitations of uh, Python while keeping all the convenience and goodness uh, of Python. Um, uh, so we have like, convenience and speed at the same time. That that was also a, a big challenge. And if I can just add on one thing, uh, if, see if my our fancy video camera can pick me up here. <laughs> uh, no, more conceptually, uh, one of the things we've been working on is really to try to also look at how we can do uh, audio and video analysis together. And this is something we had tried before as well, but it's, it's challenging in practice because these are so different signals. But I think we have achieved that to a larger extent in the Python version than we did previously. And at least we have made a kind of the groundwork for being able to, for example, have combined visualizations, but also work more towards kind of combined feature extraction and further analysis. So we're not entirely there yet, but uh, it's going in the right direction. That's very interesting. And related to that, I just had a lecture yesterday for, for uh, our uh, SNC class uh, about music and motion, and they were talking about different ways to analyze. Uh, so I'm glad to see some of, of you guys here uh, watching this uh, uh, musical gesture toolbox presentation. But um, we talked about that, that some of the things that, that are inherent in, in, uh, in gestures and uh, that you typically depart from in video um because it's it's so easy to to see perceptually the gesture and there you frequently go via annotation so what about the annotation will that uh, how can that somehow be incorporated in, uh, in a neat yeah, way now <clears throat> that's a very good point um well we yeah we haven't uh, implemented that now but uh, that's that's very interesting to see i mean as long as it's in some kind of useful representation i mean it should be possible to add it but um i guess the main point is to simplify the working with with more qualitative type of of data that's something we should uh, yeah put into the tracker yeah specifically again because that is typically what what lies um, easiest at hand for for those not really com confident with the uh, with the programming toolboxes or MATLAB or whatever, yeah. uh, but it's also like well established from the work of Davidson and others how how to use that. So I think that would be a very nice addition now that you're basing it on on video, so to speak. Mm. Um, oh, great point. Mm. So, what if you were now to to give uh, like. Uh, the, the pitch talk of, of uh, why to use this instead of the other toolboxes that are anyway starting to, to appear or other means of, of analyzing music and motion. Why, why should uh, users and or what kind of users should definitely go and check out this Python version? Well, I, I, for, first of all, if you haven't done any of this before, you should download our video analysis app, which is kind of a ready to make, just click a button and get the data out thing. Uh, that Alexander Tiedemann sitting here there uh, helped them make recently. But if you're into kind of more advanced stuff, uh, the Python thing is, is cool. And particularly now with the, what it opens for in machine learning, for example, uh, and Jupyter Notebooks, I think. Um, I would also uh, add that, um... When it comes to comparison to other toolboxes, uh, it's important to ask what other toolboxes are there out there, I mean, for Python. Because uh, when uh, we were uh, pulling together the, the article, uh, we actually went through uh, some of the 
uh, Rev and Python packages. And most of them are actually focusing on uh, an implementation of a single task, let's say uh, object separation or depth detection or pose estimation or stuff like that. And most of them are actually deep learning based. And um, so what, what I feel like um, the, the people uh, this package could be useful are the ones who are looking for some kind of easy to use high level but complete-ish solution of course, this can never be like a complete, complete, but something that, you know, you can just go to import and then sort of work uh, as, as in like a, what creates a workflow for you. So it's not just like one tool, hey, I need to do this and then, okay, let's do it. But it's actually a, a sort of ecosystem with a lot of different sub modules that you can sort of combine and use together. Very good. Thank you for that. And with that, uh, we close this session. I would like everybody to give a virtual or an auditory hand to all the presenters. Uh, and uh, I uh, would welcome everybody back to, to uh, tune in to the keynote tomorrow morning at nine o'clock.